that's a story told um, that began with images of the primordial and continuing miraculous perfection that is the creation that is this earth. Uh, it quickly went into recreations in the case of Japanese miniaturization of gardens and then a Renaissance image by Jan Bruegel the Elder creating a painting, one of many he did with Rubens of Adam and Eve in paradise and after that um, tension started to evolve in the case of some primates that you saw that are quite rare and endangered and then suddenly images of um, very crowded megacities from Jakarta to Tokyo and after that you saw countless images of species, many rare, threatened, critically endangered, right on the cusp of going extinct. Um, and in the end, several images of individuals who were working day and night, 24-7, to save every living creature they possibly can, including members of our own species. And let's think of that in terms of the title of our little talk here today, which is Biodiversity, Democracy, and Nonviolence. We conjoin these three terms, phrases, because democracy, a very ancient word, uh, arguably coming from Greece in the fifth century when the population of Athens, her capital, um, if we are to listen to Aristotle, was around 5,000. Other historians say it was closer to 200,000. That gap in understanding demography suggests and mirrors contemporary mismatches between scientific data, human perception, public policy, and the life of individuals of every species. Um, science is one form of interpretation of the universe, of course, and it's been a very potent one for a long time. But just in the last two decades, uh, scientists who work in the natural history fields have seen the projected number of species go up by a factor of, of exponentially two. So what started as a million five to 1.8 million cataloged species, and it's just that, it's a catalog card basically, a digital chip, a recognition of a specific type of DNA. We now estimate there are well over 100 million species on this planet. Every one of those species on average contains possibly as many, on average again, as three million individuals. Do the math. We're talking about a large number of life forms out there. And one of the common, perhaps the most common denominator, aside from the sheer majesty and beauty and sovereignty of each and every individual, is the fact that we are all vulnerable to pain, we all suffer. We all must endure whatever circumstances are thrown at us. And we have the great challenge in this generation, the, the duty to give back, to do everything we can to ameliorate the suffering. Buddha said life is suffering. Mahavira, the, the great sage of the Jain tradition, pretty much concurred with that and acknowledged that every living creature even the 22 billion bacteria in my armpit, the 7 million on average follicle mites in your eyelashes, all have an individual soul that needs to be respected. With those kinds of numbers, what is particularly troubling right now with respect to a democracy and the choices that a democracy invokes are the choices we will make ethically in this generation today. Because we have lots of choices at our disposal. We can choose to do virtually anything. And our choices will dictate the future of evolution on planet Earth. If you choose to be violent through indifference, through apathy, through simply turning away because it's either too much work too complicated, too overwhelming, that's a choice you make. If you choose to dive headlong into the fray, notwithstanding 
the odds against perhaps making the change you wish to see in the world, at least you've tried. Or if, like the two of us here, Jane and myself, you're a prob probabilist, somewhere between optimism and cynicism, and you really do believe, as I think you should, that you will and you can and you must make a great change, then we will save species from extinction, we will save the 42,000 odd populations that are going extinct every day, a much bigger problem. We'll recognize that every, every choice we make has echoes that are serious and significant ecologically and that the biological bottom line is that which will either make or break our species and millions of others codependent with us in this generation. Years ago, I was with Manika Gandhi, then the Minister of Forest and Environment in New Delhi in India, and we were talking about the fate of the tiger. And at that time, this is back in about 1995, uh, there were estimated to be about 1,200 tigers left in India, about 7,000 left in all of the world. And Monica said to me, as I mentioned, the next generation, the children of the future, and she got very angry with me, and she said, forget the future, forget the children, now. We have to act right now. The tigers have no hope if we don't act right now. Don't lay it off on your children. And that struck me with potent force because she's absolutely right. And that Pacific pocket mouse you saw up there, um, whose sole survival depends on congressionally mandated American public choice that Marines not only go to places like Iraq and Afghanistan, but they protect mice at Camp Pendleton just down the road here. And Colonel Seaton, who was the commander of the base at that time, uh, when that shot was taken a couple of years ago, he said very proudly, standing on top of a cliff where we were filming him in a project called Hot Spots, he says, we take it very seriously that there are nearly 20 critically endangered species at this Marine base. In fact, we take it as critically important to American culture, to the future of the planet, as we do the other tasks that the 100,000 family members and servicemen and women at Camp Pendleton are, in, are enduring on behalf of the freedoms that we all enjoy here today. Nikos Kazantzakis, the great Greek poet, philosopher, traveler, writer, who's best known for his novel Zorba the Greek, starring Anthony Quinn in the film remake, said a few beautiful lines among tens of thousands of lines. He said, after he came down from Mount Athos in Greece in the middle of winter following a 40-day sojourn, he found in this little courtyard at the base of the cliff an almond tree. In the middle of winter, very cold, there was snow up on the mountain. And he writes that he walked up to the almond tree and he said, Sister, speak to me of God. And the almond tree blossomed. He also said, I'm a mortal. I am a mortal being, but God, when I go, please take me by the longest possible route. And at the end of one of his great novels, St. Francis, he made a very interesting statement. He said, if every one of us were St. Francis, there would be no need for St. Francis. Very provocative points, because on the compass, on the atlas of our heart, we wake up every day and we know we are surrounded by violence. And we know that the challenge of nonviolence grows more substantially by the minute. There are 